We're here live at Hepton Bridge Film Festival, and I'm here today to talk about the man who wanted to fly with director Frank Shouldice, who's joining us from Ireland today. How are you, Frank? Very well, Louise. Thank you. Uh, it's so good to see you. It's been a long journey. We've been waiting to have you here. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we'll another day. I um, was really looking forward to it and uh, delighted that it's coming off in this form. Uh, it's like, um, I suppose, it's like everybody just getting on with things. And, That's right. Uh, here we are. Yeah. Hey, Frank, um, you know, what I felt like was this was the perfect film to give people a boost and to, 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 to really give everyone the sense that, you know, even under difficult circumstances, you can achieve your dreams. dreams. And I, I loved this film from the moment I saw it. I, ju I just connected to it. And the wonderful story of, of course, Bobby Coote, who never gave up the idea that he could maybe um, do his dream of wanting to fly. Do you want to take us back and sort of say, look, how did I find Bobby and his brother Ernie? Um, yeah, um, I'm really glad you, you liked it. And we, we've been chuffed really with the response to the film uh, around, around the place. Uh, it is a universal story. Um, Dave Perry and myself, Dave, Dave is, he's originally from Newcastle and he's the um, cameraman. We'd worked uh, together on some um, current affairs uh, work, which was kind of in the, the darker end of the street, the stuff we were doing, more investigative stuff. And uh, we worked really well together and we were toying around with the idea of uh, a, our own project um as a, a documentary you know whether it was short form or longer form or really to see where something would go and we were kicking around a few ideas so this was something that would be completely independent of our regular work and um uh, dave and his family live up in uh cavan uh which is up along the border between the republic and the north and um he's into flying and uh, he's a so he's a flying enthusiast. So apart from being cameraman, uh, he, he has a paramotor, which uh, for those who know it, or for those who don't know it, a paramotor is a, a single engine plane, uh, which as Dave describes it, it's like a hairdryer attached to a handkerchief. Uh, so you're literally flying over um, and it's just you, but you have to take a running start for this. I don't know anything about aviation, by the way, uh, and that was no harm because often you're you're connecting with the audience who generally don't know, have a clue either, um, and so the questions that I'd be wondering, a lot of people would be wondering. So anyway, Dave was out in his paramotor, so it's quite a rural area. He was flying around, and as he was flying, he he saw this little white speck on the ground, uh, and he noticed it at various intervals. You know. Uh, and he was, anyway, he paid little attention to it, got home and there was a ring at the, the door. So he goes out and um, there's this elderly man standing there with a baseball cap. And Dave saw over his shoulder uh, a, a Suzuki IQ and it was the white car. So it was the white speck that had been tr tracking him around the place. This was Bobby's car. And uh, and he didn't know this man, and he says to him, "Yeah, yeah, can, you know, what can I do for you, more or less?" And uh, it turned out this was Bobby Coote, and Bobby says to him, uh, "In he'll kill me for this Cavan accent impression, but he says, was that you up in the sky there flying?'" And uh, Dave says, yeah, it was. Uh, this would be my Newcastle attempt of an accident. He says, yeah, why? Uh, you know, and he, Dave was one, he was a bit worried that uh, he might have been troubling the sheep or the cattle or something. And here was a farmer who was pissed off about, you know, uh, a paramotor flying over. And Bobby says, I'd like to do that. And literally, this is where the story began. Um, so when Dave told me about this encounter, um, I thought, yeah, that's, there's something in it, but, you know, that could be a short or something or, you know, who knows if there's anything to it or not, you know, uh, it doesn't automatically mean there was something because we, we hadn't really come up with a viable idea up to that point. But when then I heard that uh, Bobby was living at home with his brother, Ernie, who was a few years older, 
And the idea that they lived in the family home, they're both bachelor farmers. They had uh, one elongated house with two separate front doors. I thought, if Ernie would come aboard, well, then we're into something. So we went up and we met the pair of them uh, individually. And we asked, you know, we said, well, listen, we don't know where this is going to go. Um, but, you know, a young and um, and they were kind of bemused that anybody would pay any attention to their lives as to, you know, and uh, their first question is Bobby's first question is always, why? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Frank, one of the questions that's already come in, I mean, I'm going to read some of these things out to you because they're so lovely. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions that has come in is um, people often want to know this. Um, how long did you film? Like how long were you filming the documentary? Yeah, well, once they were aboard, um, that they were prepared to let us go ahead. It took five and a half years. Yeah, um, yeah. Because, uh, and I, I don't uh, don't be disingenuous about it, that it wasn't like five and a half years on the job. Uh, it was that it was periodic that we'd be going back because actually, as anyone who's seen the film will see that for long periods, very little happened. And, um, so it was kind of, we didn't want to foist an ending on it. It was to let things happen. We didn't know where, where things were going to go. And, you know, the spoiler alert, there's always a very different experience talking to someone who's seen the film and someone who hasn't seen the film. So conscious of anyone watching who may not have seen it. Um, it was, there is a clue in the title, but it's like, where would this go? So over five and a half years, it was, at various stages, um, very, very uncertain where it was going to, ha what route it was going to take, or what turns it was. it was. It was unusual in a way that there was almost like this twin track because for the first three and a half years or a little bit more, it was just myself and Dave. It was just two of us made, and that gave us that intimacy and trust that the the Bobby and Ernie, and then the other people who we by extension started bringing into the story, they got used to us and they, they could trust us. And you, know, you know, Frank, it's so clear to me, uh, and, and spoiler alert, you, even if you hear us talking about the film, it's not gonna ruin. I've seen the film three times. I still can't stop smiling. I still tear up a little bit. Mm. So um, there's no problem hearing about what happens in the film. But what I was gonna say is it's really clear that you have developed this beautiful relationship and a very intimate, trusting relationship with the brothers because we get such a beautiful insight into these two bachelors, these two farmer bachelors sitting next to each other, different front doors, different ways of looking at the world. And you've got, I have to tell you, Ernie, it says here, one of the comments, I mean, I've got a lot of comments, I'm gonna read them out in a bit, but Ernie has encouraged me to get a CB rig. Now you don't hear that often. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, he's actually progressed on to, uh, it, it, I'm not technical at all actually, but he, he's got this tablet, uh, which is the, the next progression of CB radio. But, <laughs> Uh, yeah, because Ernie, um, I had this thing in my head, actually, that you had the two brothers and obviously they're very, very different. Um, and, and yet they're quite similar in a way. And the way it made sense to me was that in one way, you have Ernie, who used to bring the world into his house by mm -hmm. he went out in CB. And he this was years ago when something was very exotic, if it was from outside the parish. And uh, he was getting Q cards, QSL cards coming in from South America, South Africa, from all over Europe, from America um, and from places that he'd never heard of. Um, they were coming in on the QSL cards. And so that's the whole thing of bringing the world into Baileyborough. And while Bobby is actually going out into the world uh, and it's that yin and yang almost uh, so that even though they're very dissimilar they're quite similar in some ways yeah you know frank one of the things i must read out to you so someone has written due to my health i have been housebound for over a year my spirit soared as the plane rose and i still have happy tears on my face thank you so much nice someone else has written thank you for such a brilliant film my question has been answered because we talked about how did you find the project mm. and 
how long was the documentary made? Well, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, someone's asked, did you have a plan B for if he didn't fly? It's a great question. Um, and uh, as it went on, I, I had to think more about it. By the way, it's great to hear that somebody got a lift out of it uh, because we could all use that at the moment. So I hope I hope they're doing well. Um, the plan B, as it was going on, uh, it, it was unusual. There was almost like a twin track thing happening here. So myself and Dave, Bobby's ambition was to fly a plane. It was as simple as that. I have always wanted to do it. He became known around the town as the man who never flew because he was always talking about flying, but it had never happened. And and he says, I want to change their story. You know, I, they call me the man that never flew. And, you know, so this was his thing. So him setting about that. But for every time that um, that ambition ran aground, in a way, so did our ambition to make, make a documentary. Because it's a really good question, I think, because if, like, this, the pursuit of an ambition it has its own romance. And it, it's, it's, it, is it enough? Is it enough in a film for someone to aspire and try for something and fail or not reach it. Uh, is that enough? Is there enough optimism within that, that, you know, it's been like the same in the Olympics, you know, it's not the winning, it's taking part. Well, not everyone's convinced <laughs> about that. And where do you get that moment of uh, validation or just, uh, you know, that it actually means something uh, and that people, and how people react to this is quite extraordinary um, because I think a lot of people, whether they see it in uh, parents, grandparents, uncles, uh, especially people who have connections with the country because the isolation and everything, and people might see it in themselves because I, we've had people come up to us after saying, uh, you know, that I was f uh, 50, 60, and I've had kind of given up on stuff and I realize now <clears throat> I've no excuse. Yeah, you know, Frank, it's like we live in a very, um, it's a funny, I don't know if you've ever been to Hepton Bridge, but it's a, it's, it's a beautiful valley with, you know, little industrial towns, once, once grand, all changed, but very rural. And I, what I, I mean, a couple of things that I love about the film is the complexity in what is apparently a simple film, but there's such complexity because we just don't get to hear that narrative enough of someone like Bobby, someone sees Bobby, they make lots of assumptions. They see this old fella, you know, maybe he's a bit of a farmer, maybe he hasn't been around much. And what I love about the documentary in this beautiful, gentle way, we get to know Bobby and you unfold more and more about him. So I get to know a little bit more about him as the story goes on. I get to know about him partly because I get to see him in his wonderful sibling rivalry with Ernie and that, 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 that lovely difference. But also I think all of us make that mistake, don't we? Where we make an assumption when we see someone and we think, oh, they're just this or they're just that. And, and somehow your film tells us, you know, both, for ourselves that we can do more, but also that when we look at someone, whether it's our parents or our grandparents or a friend or whoever, they're not just what they look like. They're a whole bunch of things. And, and I love that. It, well, Bobby is pro probably quite uh, exceptional in that he's, he's a genius. You know, if you met him on the street, that may not be the first thing that jumps to mind. Uh, and I think we underestimate people. Uh, quite easily, especially where uh, people are older. Um, and it is part of the idea of this is to challenge that because we spend quite a lot of time with, we call the two boys, you know, and uh, it's, it, those two lads are never bored. So, you know, it, we're living through the lockdown now and people often ask, how are they now? And they're just fine you know, because they will never be bored. Um, they, they interest themselves in things separately, the different ways of doing things. And so it doesn't give it away, but Bobby also makes violins 
out of scrap wood. And uh, it's absolutely extraordinary to watch someone engaged in something they love doing and bring this craft. And he doesn't have the proper equipment and he doesn't have that, but he, like we, we see it in the film where he fashions a, a violin out of a piece of wood that he literally found in a stockpile of, he, he clambers over a fence. And at one stage you're, when we're making the film at various stages that you, you almost feel you should intervene and say, it's steady on, you know, because <laughs> this, this man turning 80, hops over like a mountain goat over a fence and he says because he, he he saw this piece of wood and he says i want to get it he starts pulling it out and you have to restrain yourself from going in and giving him a hand and say, wow look at this and then you're watching it evolve and his immersion in the beauty of the work that he's engaged in and this is the same fella who's walking up the street and you might completely underestimate. Um, so I think what you say is really true because no matter what, uh, you know, not everyone is going to be able to make a violin. Um, I couldn't. Um, <laughs> but it's it, you know, life, age, life experience, you know, has to count for a lot. I think we do underestimate that and, you know, and... It, we've the, a lot of um, people are reminded of that by the film, actually. And if it prompts people to be maybe to listen a bit more or be a bit kinder, uh, well, you know that's that's plus. Yeah, plus. I, I I I couldn't agree more. I think I think it it does that. We've been asked a few questions. Um, I can't wait to watch it again. Will it be out on release soon? As I'd love to buy a copy, says someone. Yeah, it's not on release. Uh, it, it is. Uh, we don't have it on uh, DVD, uh, but it is available to watch. It's up on several uh, platforms, and okay. uh, unfortunately, it's it's uh, we we haven't. It, it, that's the best that we can do at the moment. So someone could get it. So we 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 might link to that. I'll ask you after. Frank, and we might put that on our website and make sure that people know that they can get to it some other way. Yeah, it, it's up on various platforms. Uh, Volta.ie is uh, one in Dublin. Uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, yeah, you know, okay. There's, 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 we'll it, make sure. We'll Google, make sure people it, know. It's on these platforms, uh, which uh, it, often people are asking because, uh, especially if they like to, would like to show to older relatives, you know, mm. they might it might give them a bit of a, a lift or something. And it's unfor unfortunate we don't have it because everything's moved on, I suppose, that even DVDs will soon be obsolete. Just hard. There will be, there will be. You know what I would say to you though, um, uh, Frank, it, it, there's a lot of people who I know um, will want to show this to their family. I, I can tell from the comments mm -hmm. I'm getting. Someone's asked, I absolutely love the film. Has Bobby continued to fly? <laughs> um, he... Well, continue to fly. He's he's now looking at a new plane. Ah. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby's uh, relationship with the sky is a, a long and continuous one. Right. Um, so, um, he yeah he's we we don't want to kind of make a claim about within the film as well that it's absolutely true what happened was true um and there are realities about it like it, it, this is um in the plane uh that bobby went up in uh ireland isn't a great place for that type of plane nor, nor would the uk be uh because if it's very windy it doesn't suit that plane you know, mm. it, they're not really made for that. And also if it's raining, so that that rules out quite a lot here. I was going to say, windy, rainy. <laughs> yeah, he's not the right type of plane. Um, but he's 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 still pursuing it. Uh, but um, he went subsequently to Portugal to do some uh, further flying lessons. But what I was going to say was that in the course of when we were making the film, over that five and a half years, there were three fatalities um, using those type those type of planes in Ireland, because there there is there are harder truths here that 
an 82 year old, 83 year old man um, at this point, you know, taking a plane like that up on his own, uh, you know, we have to be realistic what, what he can do. Uh, because it, those planes are actually quite physical as well. He's right. a very fit man. Um, but it, it, whether it, it's something that he has to consider a different type of plane where it's less physical and it would be something where he'd fly with somebody because um, you're not allowed simply just, and for good reason, hop in a plane and take it away. You have to land. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, in the, in the film, I love the fact also that we had a period of time where Bobby himself is going, look, am I, am I being, you know, uh, am I being silly here, thinking that I can do this? Yeah. And, and that it's no mean feat, that you have to learn a lot of things. And I love the kindness in the film. So I love the, the character who decides, I'm going to help this happen. You know, the, the fellow who's going to help him get up there. And I love the neighbour, Sean, and everybody. It, it is, it, again, it was almost like a corollary between us making the film, because we went up... And we were asked by various people, you know, at different stages. Uh, so, oh, you're making a film. So, and especially when we were looking for favors. <laughs> so we'd be asked, uh, so what's your budget? And uh, well, we'd say, well, we actually don't have one. Uh, so, you know, we needed the help, the, the kindness of strangers in a way. Um, but in the, in the way that Bobby couldn't have done what he did without the help, just gracious, generous help and interest of people. We couldn't have made the film without that same thing. And I think this is something that people really tune into. There's a, a sense of community about it because the, the Jerry Snodden and Newton Ards and others who helped, Joe McIver, who helped get the plane airborne. Um, and Jerry took a personal interest in, in what Bobby's you know, pursuit was. Without that, uh, nothing could have happened. Uh, it would have been a very different, going back to the other question, we would have had a very different film. Um, and also with the, with the the goodwill, and there was something in this time, we're living in a more materialistic time. Uh, I live in the city, this is set in the country. Um, but there was something that really moved me that uh, on what we call the big day near the end of the film, uh, where the, the, the field was being set out as a runway. And um, the, the goodwill behind it is something that actually um, rippled through when we were making the film, that we'd be pulling in people, we'd be asking, could they help us? And nobody ever said no. That is a lovely story to hear because I, I feel like, Frank, this, this is one of those films that it doesn't have a shelf date. It's, it's just a lovely, lovely story. Um, several comments coming in saying, uh, love the film, um, would you come back? And, and, and a follow-up film would be amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, what was that uh, film, Ernie Rides Again, you know, it's like, <laughs> Bobby yeah. Rides Again. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the follow up. Um, I think, I think we actually need to look at something else, you know, uh, because sometimes it's almost a bit to leave something well enough alone, you know, yeah. th there's something really beautiful. I'm delighted to, with the comments, by the way, uh, because that it would reach people, because it is a universal thing. There's no question about it. This could be in Yorkshire as easy as it could be in Cavan, you know. Uh, the, the two lads could be two sheep farmers in northern Greece as much as two uh, bachelor farmers in Cavan. You know, it, these are universal themes that come up through it. And uh, I... I, I there's a, there is an optimism within it that um, I think people could really do with. Um, and maybe this is, but that and the community, the sense of people helping each other. Um, and I, w I would underline the fact that we, when we went to the people to help us making it, it's because they were kind of taken by the idea that they, they got behind it as well. So uh, long before, like a production company came, got involved with it, a loose horse without whom we couldn't have completed the film the irish film board we couldn't have completed the film because we we could 
we did this at our own expense, out of our own pocket for three and a half years plus. Um, but it got to a point where you're lo- turning a project into a production and um, we couldn't have done that without the assistance that came in. So, but it wouldn't have started without the goodwill of, of people. And I think that just comes through it. Yeah, I think, I think, I think for sure. Look, I would love to talk to you um, forever about the film. And I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted that like me, so many people have been touched by the film and the generosity and the kindness that, that you bring to the film yourself and also what's in the film for the people in it, just it just comes off the screen and it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing and there's lots that we haven't touched on that's in the story. So I urge people who've been on the festival, if they haven't had a chance yet to, to watch the film, to dive in there and, and, and take, take a... Take a it, we, you're right, Frank, we need stories like this right now, don't we? To give us a lift and um, I'm just delighted to be able to talk to you finally even if one day we are going to welcome you here to Hebden Bridge and it'll be just such a delight so thank you so much for being such a fabulous guest. Uh, thanks a million Louise and um, we just if people see it we, we have a Facebook page the man who wanted to fly and you know if they want to make comments or they can put through that too and we'll, we'll pass on anything to Bobby and Ernie uh, because they're bemused when we went to them in the first place. It's like, why would you want to make a film about us? And uh, then when we had the, you know, the the premiere, and then we had we brought them, and we, we were at a festival in in Kells, and uh, it was a sunny day, and there was champagne and ice cream, and the lads came, and they had such a ball. And at one stage, uh, Ernie just pulled me aside and he just says, uh, why, why are they so interested, you know? Because, it, and mind you, we began to wonder then, was Bobby taking a trip down Bailiborough, down the main street? And actually, Louise, I, I leave you just with one, because there was one thing that really uh, caught my, just caught me really. Uh, the, the film was shown in the in a revamped courthouse in Bailiborough on the main street. And um, it was, most people who were there had seen it already. And it was, they made a tribute to Bobby and they gave him this model plane. And it was a lovely night. And I, I, Dave, uh, Dave was working in the UK at the time. So I went up and so it was just myself and Bobby. And we said we'd go for a pint afterwards. So we're walking up the street anyway, and uh, he it had been a great night and his home, own town kind of celebrated him, you know. So we we're walking up, just the two of us up the town, and I saw this kid, t- a couple of kids up on the, the path further up the road, and they were watching him coming up. And one of them, his jaw just dropped. And he, I heard him saying to the other fellow, and Bobby didn't hear it, but he one kid says to the other, he says, there's the man who wanted to fly. And he, you might as well have been saying, there's Superman. And the idea, and Bobby didn't know us, and I, I, I didn't say anything because it was such a beautiful moment because he watched him pass by. And it was just that. That's a beautiful story, Frank. We're going to go off air in a minute, so I don't want to lose it, and I don't want to lose you, but I, I, I from okay. the bottom of my heart, Thank you so much for coming to us and and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Louise. And thanks to everyone at the festival. Take care.